Welcome to our healing meditation service. We're going to be doing a call and response chant, and um, I call and you respond. We try to keep it as simple as possible. The statements are just, just wonderful things to lift you into understanding that everything is created by the Creator. So shall we begin and just get yourself comfortable. I don't care if you want to lay down on a pew or whatever. It's just you want to let your body get out of, of your thought process. Just And whatever you have to do, do that, that. Those beautiful pews, they're great also to lay on. So don't worry about it. All right, let's go. Thank you. This is Larry and Louie.
Good morning, everyone. <coughs> As uh, most of you know, I began my spiritual journey in New York City at the Association of Research and Enlightenment. However, in New York City, that wasn't their main center. In fact, the Association of Research and Enlightenment, which has their main center in Virginia Beach, Virginia, <clears throat> didn't even know there was a center there because it was just a little apartment up a steep flight of stairs in this rather old building in not the best <clears throat> neighborhood in New York City. But um, we would have every Wednesday evening search for God group and discussions around the books that came through Edgar Cayce, which is what the foundation was for. We would do the search for God. And on Saturday all day, we had dream interpretation groups, prayer groups and meditation groups. I remember that there were some amazing insights into uh, the reality of the presence here and now, even though <clears throat> that particular idea of the here and now presence of God uh, was something that was beyond most of the people meeting at that time. Even the leader of that center, who was in his 60s with his wife, for some reason they, they started this thing. We only had probably 20 or 30 people, and that was crowded when we had 20 or 30 people up in this apartment. <clears throat> And I remember a dream that uh, the gentleman who was running the center, Joseph Mead, gave. He said he was walking in the forest with his dog and uh, his dog was leading him somewhere. He felt being led by his dog. And he came to a place in the forest where there was this beautiful light, beautiful light, circular light, and standing in that light were, were two people. He didn't know whether they were men or female, they were dressed in white. And uh, he asked the people at that globe of light what it was, and they said, this is heaven. And he said, can I enter? And they said to him, yes, you can enter, but your dog can't. <laughs> and he said, then this can't be heaven. And he walked away with his dog. And we had an amazing discussion about that because Joe Mead actually had a wonderful, friendly, loving mutt of a dog. And uh, he went on to say that because we understand that the kingdom of heaven or God is a, is a consciousness of God, an awareness of God, we open up to become representatives of the character of God. He said, which my dog uh, emulated way beyond me because my dog doesn't find fault uh, doesn't harbor envy or resentment. By the way, that's Edgar Cayce's line, uh, one of his favorite admonitions. Find no fault, harbor no envy or resentment. But I think Eckhart Tolle related the ideal of dog consciousness best in this particular Quote, can we have this, please? He's early. <laughs> You're supposed to bring him after the quote. I, I will never get it. Come here, come here, bring him up. <laughs> I don't read it, so I think I can control it. <laughs> 
<laughs> the playfulness and joy of a dog is unconditional love and readiness to celebrate life at any moment, often contrasts sharply with the inner state of the dog's owner, depressed, anxious, burdened by problems, loss in thought, not present in only place in the only time there is, here and now. One wonders, living with this person, how does the dog manage to remain so sane, so joyous? <laughs> okay, bring him over. Hey, Teton. See, see, I wanted to give a demonstration. <laughs> All right, you got it. You did a good job. Huh? I'm going to have to give the rest of the talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. You can take him. Yes. A practical demonstration like that is always worth more <laughs> than words. Uh, of course, the nature of the dog is a given. And most people don't realize that the nature of humanity is also a given, but <clears throat> we left the Garden of Eden to choose it. We left the consciousness divine because it was bestowed and we left it until we chose it. We are in the position here <clears throat> where if we want to enter into the true nature that is at the core of our being, which is the nature of God, <clears throat> we have to choose it. It's not bestowed, it's chosen. But it exists forever and is always available to anyone who so decides to choose it. And I think it's said beautifully this way by <coughs> Toltec master, Don Miguel Ruiz. Can we have this next PowerPoint, please? You can read this in the Four Agreements. Heaven or hell is here and now. You don't need to wait to die. If you take responsibility for your own life, for your own actions, then your future is in your hands and you can live in heaven while your body is alive. Heaven or hell is here and now. You don't need to wait to die. If you take responsibility for your own life, for your own actions, then your future is in your hands and you can live in heaven while your body is alive. Interestingly enough, the Pope, when he was here probably three or four years ago, I forget, he was in <clears throat> the United States. During an interview he said that fact that hell and heaven are states of consciousness. He might have gotten some flack from the bishops back in Rome, but that's what he said in an interview. It's a state of consciousness. And so here we are aspiring to enter that state of consciousness. But again, it has been covered over in our lives by long periods of imbibing false ideas, false information. And so in order for us to re-enter that state which the masters speak about, they speak from the direct experience of knowing that state of consciousness. They have transcended the limited thinking in our awareness that comes with living in the outer-directed, illusion-driven, conflict-oriented world. <laughs> they transcended that. You say, how can it be transcended? It is transcended by a willingness 
to experience beyond one's personal perception. And that willingness is called faith. And all you, I mean, most of you people here have already <clears throat> touched that consciousness of God, had moments or possibly more in the awareness of that presence where you felt the majesty and the miracle of life in its truest form, where there was no resentment, there was no envy, but the insight that is necessary is that in that state of consciousness, that divine level of awareness, to find no fault, to harbor no envy, and no resentment is experienced from those around you as well. See, the initial idea when it comes to us has us believe that there's this higher level of consciousness in which I really experience the presence of God and I find no fault with anything, I harbor no envy, I harbor no resentment. But you see, that's not the all of it. This is what makes it so perfect, is that in that state, you recognize it in everyone around you and in everything. There's a state where life appears sacred in every way. So it starts with the ideal of becoming one who finds no fault, harbors no envy and no resentment. It starts with that. It takes the practice of looking past the seeming foibles of others who are around us in our life, in the places where we work and carry on our presence. And so we're practicing true forgiveness. We may have started with forgiveness as we understand it, which is forgiveness after the fact. Forgiveness after the fact means that I recognize the affronts, the attacks, the foibles and the limited behavior of others. But I am expanded enough on the journey to overlook it. But you see, the flaw, the error, was made real. In the consciousness of God, the flaw and the error is not made real. Because in the consciousness of God, the ego has been dissolved. There is no such perception. It's the outer directed world that lives in the understanding and experience of separation. And it continues on and on and on like that and does whatever it can to distract itself pleasure itself, do what it can to get on and on, but still does the spiritual practice. If you want life, true life, it requires an attention beyond the casual. To enter sacred awareness so that even the impulse to find fault no longer exists because the joy of being God conscious 
so carries your awareness before you that there is no opportunity for conflict, resentment, blame, guilt, or punishment. Now I know, because I know from experience. I wasn't, I didn't grow up as an altar boy, or I didn't grow up in the Association of Research and Enlightenment. <clears throat> so I had a, uh, I learned a lot of the wrong things, carried on in a limited lifestyle. Slowly but surely, uh, waking up to the idea that life doesn't work from the illusion of personal perception and then making certain changes. But they're hard changes to make. You'll recall that on my spiritual journey at one place, I forget just about where, but somewhere after I had been involved with the Association of Research and Enlightenment, I offered the life presence, call it the Holy Spirit, God, Christ, Buddha nature, whatever. I offered it the opportunity to remove from me any limitations I was willing to release. So I had a table in my mind. And if there was something that I would catch myself doing or recognize taking place or people would point out to me, and in the ARE that I went to, people would point it out to you, uh, that, that you had this thing going on. You're just too overbearing or you're insecure or you should never have said that that way you said it because it offended you know, people in the ARE would let you know right away, this is not what you should be doing. Anyway, if you discovered something within your character, your consciousness, or even in your life, uh, that was not in keeping with the divine ideal, then in my mind, I would put it on the table for the divine to remove and take away. And when you do that, it's not an easy deal. Things happen that test you to the very core. I mean that still today. There are, I'm, I'm, I know you're hoping that this minister has rare moments of those foibles. <laughs> I spend a lot of time in the holy awareness, but I have to say that occasionally things do happen in my consciousness that I, I don't think should go along with it. And I'll tell you some of those things next week. If you convince 40 people to show up here <laughs> at 9 a.m., I'm talking to you that are watching this live stream. Look at how many foibles you have. You have one right now because you're just sitting down drinking coffee when you should be tooling in full force in the physical right here. All right, and see, there's another foible right there. I'm being... <laughs> Let me take you to the place that it's hard to go to. Here we have this next overhead. You can read this in the Course in Miracles text, page 156, or the new edition, 168. At one mint is for all, because it is the way to undo the belief that anything is for you alone. To forgive is to overlook. Look then beyond error, and do not let your perception rest upon it. For you will believe what you per your perception holds. Accept as true only what your brother and sister is. If you would know yourself, perceive what he is not or she is not, and you cannot know what you are because you see him or her falsely. Remember always that your identity is shared and that its sharing is its reality. Who 
would write anything like this. Can we take this back again, please? I, I love it because it is so clear. And yet, to the mind that has grown up in the illusion-driven, conflict-oriented world, it seems only odd, hard to get your head around. Uh, <clears throat> so in looking upon it, a declaration of the consciousness that we are seeking, which is true at one moment. And it's for all, because it is the way to undo the belief that anything is for you alone. To forgive is to overlook. Look then beyond error, and do not let your perception rest upon it, for you will believe what your perception holds. Accept as true only what your brother and sister is. If you would know yourself, perceive what he or she is not, and you cannot know what you are, because you see them falsely. Remember always that your identity is shared and that its sharing is its reality. This is just a confirmation of the ideal as I presented it a couple of minutes ago, where we have a tendency on a spiritual journey to get to a certain place where I don't find fault. I harbor no envy. I ha harbor no resentment for a period, a space of time. But it's always the assumption that, well, there'll still be people harboring that stuff and doing those things that I will have to forgive and look past. So we're talking about a state of consciousness in which the master of masters said, that I pray that you do not take my disciples out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So they remain in the world, but they are no longer of the world. It means that at some point, our spiritual practice becomes the priority. And nothing that takes place in the world itself <coughs> can take us away from that practice. And that practice alone will make us divine, not only in origin, because everyone is divine in origin, but it will make us divine in nature. And I think that uh, the ideal presented here about looking past, in forgiveness we look past the mistakes of others. And what we are doing is we are on that journey of recognizing consciousness, a shared consciousness of divine awareness that cannot be shaken or moved from the joy, the peace, and the love that it feels. Even though it may carry on a personal, physical life, it is no longer made happy by the conditions of life outside, made sad by the conditions of life outside, or tossed this way to be angry, or tossed that way to be forgiving. It is because the joy of that awareness leads us to meditate each day and to carry that meditation, that awareness with us so that we are no longer ourselves in the world. But we have overcome the world. So we'll look at this next PowerPoint, please. 
here's our practice. And we might want to take this up this week especially. You can read this in a Course in Miracles text, 191 or the new edition, 206. Every person you meet becomes a witness for Christ or the ego, depending on what you perceive in him or her. Everyone convinces you of what you want to perceive and of the reality of the kingdom you have chosen for your vigilance. Everything you perceive is a witness to the thought system you want to be true. Every person has the power to release you if you choose to be free. You cannot accept false witness of any person unless you have evoked false witness against him or her. If anyone speaks not of Christ to you, you spoke not of Christ to her or him. You hear but your own voice, and if Christ speaks through you, you will realize the divine one reality. Can we take this back again, please? Every person you meet becomes a witness of Christ or for the ego, depending on your, depending on what you, what you perceive in him or her. Everyone convinces you of what you want to perceive, and of the reality of the kingdom you have chosen for your vigilance. Everything you perceive is a witness to the thought system you want to be true. Every person has the power to release you if you choose to be free. You cannot accept false witness of any person unless you have evoked false witness against him or her. If anyone speaks not of Christ to you, you spoke not of Christ to her or him. You hear but your own voice, and if Christ speaks through you, you will realize the divine one reality. So we're going to take some time to meditate, <clears throat> which is to withdraw from the thinking of the world that is with us almost continually, as Eckhart Tolle would point it out. So we don't try to turn it off. We can't. We simply relax it. We rest in a mantra or a breathing exercise that gives attention to the core nature, the intelligence and presence of God. So we're going to do that together. Begin by taking a couple of deep breaths, listening to the beautiful tones of this crystal bowl. And then we will have <clears throat> a mantra to reflect upon. given to Moses and related in the New Testament a lot by Jesus. I am.
I am in you. You are in me. I am they. I am he. I am you. I am she. Everything you think, you think of me. Everything you do, you do to me. Be still and know that I am God. I am they, I am she, I am you, I am he. Everything you think, you think of me. Everything you do, you do to me. Be still and know that I am God. stars and the sea. Everything you think, you think of me. Be still and know that I am God.
as we go forth from this meditation to those places we occupy in time and space. Let us go forth with a determination to be awake in the process of living so that we can live in the divine consciousness. For this opportunity in every moment, we give thanks. To this we say, Amen. We will take an offering for unity now. As we're preparing to do this, I'd like to say, if you decide you want to meet and discuss, <clears throat> you can still do that. But I will not be in that discussion group following a service. <clears throat> I've got a board meeting uh, taking place. <clears throat> so you can start and discuss, but I won't be there uh, this time. Everyone online, I am challenging you to put in an appearance here at the services that we do. You don't have to put them in every Sunday, but once in a while, show up. And uh, you might decide you experience more of the energy here if you're in person. OK. Um, those of you that are seated here, everyone, let's just bring to mind that financial gift we'd like to make to Unity of Boulder. And uh, we can bless it with this offering prayer. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive because I give. And so it is. Join me now, please. We dedicate this tithe to the will and the work of the spirit of truth, the spirit available to each of us, the spirit that joins all of us. We dedicate this tithe to the victory of the spirit of truth. Amen. Okay, those of you who'd like to hang around, we have some great refreshments in Fellowship Hall, and you can hang out there and chat, carry on, and then come in for the next service at 11 o'clock with Sintisha. So you are invited to come and share in the next service at 11 o'clock. To everyone, have a beautiful day.